afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Lukovic, and I am the president of JALP. Aside from a bit of a slowdown earlier today on the conference website, I hope that you're having an excellent conference experience so far and that you are able to meet, share, and connect, which is the mission statement of JALT. I hope to personally see and meet you later tonight at the awards ceremony. That's the Michelle Steele Best of JALT Awards starting at 7.45 tonight. Today, I have the great fortune of, of introducing to you today's plenary speaker, Mr. Baye McNeil. I was able to meet him several years ago before the pandemic at a meeting of the Society of Writers, Editors, and Translators. He is an author, columnist, ALT, and an activist, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. He is the author of not one, but two critically acclaimed books on life in Japan, titled, Hi, My Name is Loco, and I'm a Racist, and Loco in Yokohama. His column, Black Eye, featured in the Japan Times, focuses on the image of blackness in Japan and the lives of people of color from the African continent and the diaspora living in Japan. He has written for other numerous publications, including the Washington Post and Toyo Keizai, and has been featured on the BBC along with a long list of others. So again, I have the great pleasure of introducing Mr. Baye McNeil to you as today's plenary speaker. A round of applause, please. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, Wayne and Addie and, Do and Dawn. You guys have been great. I really appreciate um, you giving me this opportunity to um, share some of my journey. So I have a lot to cover So and not a lot of time to do it. So I think we should get started immediately. So I'm going to switch and start to share my screen. So name of, name of my talk is uh, From Activist to ALT to Activists Abroad. Um, first, before we get started, I think we should have a working definition of what is activism. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, activism is about taking action to bring about change. And, it, and there are many types of activism, of course, but the ones I engage in primarily um, are, of course, writing, as well as um, teaching and doing speaking engagements. So uh, there's other, other types, of course. There's uh, some of the ones listed here, writing letters, political campaigning, boycotting, patronizing, prefer preferentially uh, patronizing businesses. There's hashtag activism, there's hacktivism. So I just wanted to make sure we have a, a, a working definition of what activism is before I get started, because I'll be talking about it um, in depth. So part one is uh, the birth of a birth of an activist. So I was not, I was not born an activist. I was, however, born into a time where activism was a part of the culture. Um, and it's difficult to, and it was difficult to avoid because then as now, being black in America is practically a crime. I was just another black baby boy as Melly Mel of, uh, of uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five once said, blind to the ways of mankind. However, my mother, she was nothing. She was anything but blind. Uh, what is now being referred to as critical race theory um, isn't new by any means. Um, many educators, black and white, have known for centuries that miseducation um, derived from the white supremacist mindset would be detrimental in the extreme to all to all minds subjected to it, in particular to black minds. And like millions of black people um, at the time, my mother migrated from the terrorism and tyranny of her home in Savannah, Georgia, um, to the uh, abject poverty in New York City in the late 50s. And by the 60s, she was, uh, she believed things were getting better for black people, that black power was a real thing, but like many, at the time, the assassinations of both Martin Luther King and Malcolm X shook her to the core and activated her. Um, and in the late 60s and early 70s, she became an activist in the Black Power Pan-African movements of the, of the late 60s, early 70s. Um, she got involved uh, with an institution that will remain in our lives to this very day. This institution was known as the East. This is a uh, 
uh, a later pitch, not at a, not during its uh, heyday, but this was after the fact. Um, the East was a cultural movement in Bethesda, Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, and the goal of, of these revolutionaries that began the East, um, that founded the East, was to build a self-reliant Black community. And under the East umbrella, there was a food co-op, there was a, a restaurant, a bookstore, a newspaper, and most importantly, a school. The name of the school was Uhuru Sasa Shule. Um, and this is Swahili, the translation is Freedom Now School. And the goal of the school was to de-Europeanize black minds and to instill within black souls, love, respect, and admiration for black history, black culture, black language, I mean, not black, <laughs> um, African language. And of course, this was their take on critical race theory. Um, their, their, their way to address it was to remove Black kids from um, public school education. So instead of uh, learning how great um, white people are, as, uh, as was the case in public school, public school education, uh, that's what the children, all children were subjected to, we learned about our own contributions to history, to music, to art, to even the formation of America. And how there is no America without Black contribution. So um, this picture you're looking at right now is a, my picture of my first grade class. Can you see me in the picture? Can you find me? Maybe not. Here I am in the back row. So um, this is me at seven years old. Um, this, this was the environment in which I was activated, so to speak. This was my my first, actually my first act of activism was on my first day of school because at that time um, I have I was going by my slave name, my government name, which is Kirk, Kirk McNeil. And at the school they they explained to us on the first day that None of the children in this school can be referred to by these slave names. I'm not sure how many of you are, are familiar with the history of American names as they pertain to African Americans, but most of the African Americans were received their names from their slave masters. So it's kind of like a, a branding, if you if you you know if you will. So the McNeil brand or uh, the Kirk brand. But the school was not tolerant of. So at on that very first day, they instructed me to choose my own name. So here I am at six, I think six or seven years old. And they told me that I needed to choose my own name. And that was the day I chose Baye. This was from a book of African names. And Af um, Baye is a Senegalese name, meaning straightforward. My second act, oh, sorry. And this is, uh, as you can see, the classes weren't like numeric. The classes had, we, the class, each class had the name of African tribe, Kush or uh, Ashanti. So you can see the name of my first class, my first grade class was Ashanti. This is a tribe in, in Africa. My second act of activism was also in my first grade year. And that year was the year that Clifford Glover was murdered. Um, he was murdered by a police officer, Thomas Shea. And Thomas Shea, he was actually the first police officer to ever be indicted for murder in New York City. But nonetheless, he was acquitted by a jury of his peers. And this sparked all types of protests. The school, in addition to the other, uh, in addition to um, English and, well, actually, let, let me tell you a little bit about the school's curriculum. So. If you go to a public school, for example, generally the, the foreign language that you would, would learn would be French or Spanish at that time. But in this school, we were taught Swahili and we use Swahili in the school. Um, so for language classes, we did Swahili. Of course, we had still had science and math and history. We learned, instead of learning 
exclusively about European or American history from the white supremacy perspective, we learned about black contributions to black history. So in addition to learning about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, we were learning about George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington and these types of people. So there was a there was parity and there was balance in the education we were receiving. Also, um, our social studies class, in addition to the book and the textbooks that we were using, we were also doing field work. We would go out into the streets and we would protest, boycott shops that were discriminating against people of African descent, protest. Um, this, this particular protest was a, a, a protest in response to the the um, acquittal of Thomas Shea. So we were there, this is at seven years old, we were out in the street protesting. Also, um, um, Nelson Mandela at that time was still uh, a political prisoner in South Africa and we were protesting against apartheid. I'm sure I'm in this picture somewhere, this is, but I can't find myself, but definitely I was at this particular protest. So. Um, the school was very active in, in politics and the children, there was no exception, regardless of age, we all were there on the front lines of these battles against uh, um, oppression. So following my time at the school, um, I, I learned, actually I, I began to write while I was still at the school. I didn't realize that was going to be my future vocation, but I did feel like I could make a contribution through the arts. So I was more, I was attracted to other people who were making, who were addressing the ills in society through art. People such as uh, John michel Basquiat and uh, Spike Lee and um, Chuck D from Public Enemy. These were some of my role models and heroes at the time because um, they were using their voices, their art to, to uh, amplify their voices. Um, one of the, the guiding principles, I would say, of, of um, some of the ideas that Yuhuru Sasa was trying to get across was this, this, this understanding about injustice and how it impacts everyone. And this particular quote from, um, from, from Martin Luther King definitely I felt resonates with exactly what the principles of the school um, adhere to. And this particular quote I still carry with me wherever I go because I feel like it had, it's, uh, it's kind of a guiding principle for all the work I've been doing, not only before I came to Japan, it, before I came to Japan but also here in Japan. So um, the quote is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. So whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So this quote really resonated with me and, and continues until this day. Um, I, I'm really indebted to my mother for, for for, for everything I've done since um, since the childhood, because it was her who who instilled within me this the spirit of you can make a difference. I remember one day I was uh, I was angry because this particular school, even though it sounds like it was it was a a, a brilliant institution, it, it had its it had its issues. I mean, there was corporal punishment in this school, for example, and uh, this, it was very strict. It very uh, the, the, a lot of the teachers were, uh, were strict disciplinarians. So I used to say to my mother, "Why, why are you forced me to go to this school?" Not only that, but this was not the the, the general thought. What what we were learning at this school was not the general thought of the community at that time. So um, you know, at this time the vast majority of African Americans were, were being miseducated in the public school system. So they, they had a very negative perspective on Africa. So they see me dressed in my school uniform, which often was a kufi and a dashiki. So I'm dressed like this, this African. And um, it was, they, they would criticize me as a kid, you know, being sensitive as I was, and a lot of children are, you know, I, was, I responded to that, you know, very severely. So my mother, 
I asked my mother one day, why? Why do you, why do you make, force me to endure this? And this is what she told me. I never forgot it. She said, I want you to make a difference, by you I see a spark of brilliance in you. And I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but this, this is basically what she told me. It stuck with me ever since. You know, that what she was doing, what this, what she believed this school was doing for me was much more important than uh, making sure I was comfortable at that, at that age. So um, I'm, I'm really indebted to her for, for, for making sure that, you know, I, I had, a, I received the proper education at that time. Um, you're, you're actually, this is a great, great timing to learn about the, the East because there's a, a new documentary that's coming out next year about the East. It, um, they have a pre, they have previews on YouTube right now. So you can check out the trailers on YouTube, but um, there's a new documentary coming out about my school and the organization that founded my school called The Sun Rises in the East. And um, here's the information, a link, if you wanna get more information about my school and the, the organization that, um, that founded my school. So let's move on to part two, teaching and learning here in Japan. So I came to, when I, when I came to Japan, of course, um, um, I, I was chock full of these beliefs on how things should be and, and how people should behave and how I should be viewed and how I should be treated. And um, most of these views came from not only my experiences with Yuhuru Sasa, but also, you know, just from, you know, being, being American, you know, you, 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 you get these ideas about what's the, you know, what's the best way to, to, for a country to be or for people to be. And then you come to Japan and things are very different. So um, when I came to Japan with these ideas, this mindset, you know, Japan promptly told me, uh, Sumimasen, this is not America, this is Japan. So you best get that through your thick skull if you plan to be here any longer than uh, vacation's length, because um, Japan was not going to um, adjust itself according to my beliefs and according to what how I thought things should be. Um, so over over time, I began to, to put together some survival principles that I thought would, but that I believe would help me to keep my wits about me while I'm working in these schools and working with these kids and and um, dealing with this different culture and a different uh, mindset. And the first one was I need to clean house. So uh, I need to be able to look at the behaviors that I've been taught to be offended by every day and somehow not take offense. And this is not a simple, simple task. It, it took some time and it took some doing, but little by little over the years, I've been able to, to clean house, so to speak. Actually, if you check out my TED Talk, this is pretty much what my TED Talk is about. It's about um, making the adjustments necessary in order to thrive in a new environment. So I finally recognized the ignorance that was, and arrogance that was deeply embedded in me. And that took some doing, but I did finally reach it and overhaul it, um, keeping what was useful and disposing of the useless. And the second thing that gets me through the, the rough patches here is that I, I don't focus primarily on teaching English. I try to be an ambassador to the outside world here, not, a, and not strictly an ambassador to Blackness. I don't want it to be about race necessarily. It's just, a, and I think that the, the people here, particularly the children who I'm educating, would benefit, would benefit greatly from um, being exposed to ideas other than the ones that they're exposed to on a daily basis. And for someone to counter some of the presumptions and, and stereotypes that have happened, you know, that they're, that they're being served here on a regular basis. And by doing that, I felt like I was doing something very productive. So that was the second way I kept my wits about me. But other than that, you know, I, of course, living in Japan as a non-Japanese, you're going to have certain challenges. And, but, um, yeah, I was enjoying my life tremendously. 
Um, but there was this, this uh, my nemesis here in Japan was what came to be, what I came to call the empty seat phenomenon. And, um, and I'm sure many of you who may be conspicuous non-Japanese here in Japan probably have experienced this from time to time, you know, some more than others, but everyone's probably experienced it. And um, this is a, a, a phenomenon that takes place when you're on trains or buses or in public spaces. A lot of times the seats around you may not be filled or will be emptied upon your um, taking a seat in that area. And um, how you manage the feelings that uh, occur as a result of this behavior will determine how you, how, you know, how, how satisfied you will be with your life here, the quality of your life here in Japan. Because for me personally, I felt feelings of alienation, of, of isolation, ostracization, criminalization, objectification, dehumanization at times. So it was really, really rough for me, this particular, um, this particular phenomenon that you have to deal with here in Japan. And uh, when I talked to my friends about it, you know, they would tell me different coping mechanisms that they use. For example, hey, it's more space. That means more space for you. Why you, you know, why does that bother you? You should be happy. You know, some people say, hey, shogunai, it's just the Japanese way. That's their style. They're, they're shy, you know, they're uncomfortable around foreigners. But for me, it became a, an impetus for creativity. And this is when I started the blog, Loco in Yokohama. This was in 2008. And what I did was um, I, I took these feelings, this, uh, this anger or this sadness or this bitterness or this, these feelings that I had no other outlet for and I put it into to my writing. And I found comical ways or, you know, different ways to to, to release it. So in that way, local Yokohama became very cathartic for me. It became uh, my, coping, my coping mechanism. And the very first post, as you can see here, October 16th, almost, uh, well, almost uh, <laughs> very recent. I mean, very uh, close to the anniversary of this, but this was on October 16th, um, 2008. This was my first post on the blog, um, an empty seat on a crowded train. And my very first post went viral because apparently, and, and I had searched the Japan blogosphere at that time, no one was really talking about these types of issues here. Most of the bloggers were focusing on, you know, uh, you know, uh, shrines and temples and food and women or whatever, you know, just anything but, you know, the, the heavy issues. Everyone was just focusing on the, the, the beauty of Japan and the uh, and, and there's a lot to focus on there, but no one was talking about this. And apparently many people were experiencing this, but avoiding talking about it. So here I came along and started talking about it and it grew a lot of attention. The first post went viral and it was a hell of a launch from my blog and it became one of the most uh, prominent blogs in Japan. Um, and at the heart of local Yokohama were these particular issues. And this is why it was so, uh, I don't know that I think this is why people found it so compelling is that I was talking about heavy, heady issues like is the racialized behaviors aimed at non-Japanese intentional or unintentional? And these type of things. So you can take a look at these, these issues um, at your leisure, but uh, these are the types of questions that local Yokohama posed and addressed and answered. And there was a, a correspondence between me and uh, blog readers. And based on the, the success of the blog, I put together a couple of books. Uh, the first book was Hi, My Name is Loco and I'm a Racist. And the um, second book was Loco Yokohama. The first book was dealing with um, not only my experiences, um, the experiences I've had with my racialized experiences in America, but in Japan as well. And, um, it did really well. It was, uh, it was it was very critically acclaimed, and um, if you have opportunity, check it out. Also, uh, 
um, the second book, Love Yokohama, was kind of a response to the first book because many people, they, they finished the first book and they loved it, but they, they had the question, well, if, if Japan um, kind of confronts you with these types of challenges on a regular basis, why are you still there? So I wrote the second book to kind of talk about why I was still there and how I've been able to build relationships and maintain. So local Yokohama kind of focuses primarily on my experiences in the schools here where I've been able to build relationships with coworkers and with um, the students and how I've been able to, to manage, you know, and maintain my sanity, you know, under, under duress. So um, check them out if you have an opportunity. So now I want to talk a little bit about some of the activism I got into here in Japan. Um, um, just a reminder of what activism is, um, writing is also a form of activism. And based on the success of my blogs and books, I was approached by Japan Times about doing a one-off article and naturally as you know I'm inclined to do um, I wrote about something that was uh, very uh, controversial and this was the, the the use of katakana in the schools I found that personally my I'm of the mind that um, it's kind of detrimental to students to 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 study English and katakana at the same time because they kind of they, they're very they conflict with one another and um, so I wrote an article about that and it, it triggered a very heated uh, online debate over whether katakana should be eradicated or not. So um, if you have opportunity, you, you can find the article, it's online, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Uh, the artwork was done by my wife at the time. Uh, well, she's done my wife. And um, yeah, she, <laughs> anyway, this was our first um, project that we worked on together. My first article and her first uh, artwork published. So very proud of this. And um, the, the response was so, uh, so strong that um, later I was offered a column to, uh, to continue, you know, making, you know, addressing some of the issues that weren't being addressed in the media here. And initially, I wasn't really keen on, on writing a column for an English language newspaper because I felt like the, the only way that you could really ad address significantly um, the issues here in Japan is if you do so in Japanese. If you do so in English, it's just kind of preaching to the choir kind of thing. And I really wasn't interested. But um, after speaking with the editors at Japan Times, when they uh, mentioned to me that you know, a good, I think they said 25 to 35% of the readership of Japan Times are, you know, second, um, are Japanese readers. So I said, whoa, okay, I didn't, I had no idea. I just kind of imagined that it was just English readers that were um, consuming this particular media. So I reconsidered and I began the column mostly as kind of a, a PR. PR for, for Blackness here in Japan, because I felt like a lot of the, the issues that confront um, people of African descent here in Japan, like uh, um, police harassment or, um, you know, just a lot of the ignorance and a lot of the uh, stereotyping, is because there's not enough information about us here. You know, left to its own devices, there won't there wouldn't be many stories in the major media about people of African descent here because our numbers are not really that significant here. But um, I took it upon myself to just kind of address that to make sure that you know uh, the people here and not just Japanese but other other um, nationalities here were aware that you know, black people were more than just basketball and hip hop and stuff. That there are people here. There's black lawyers here. Uh, presidents of universities and people in medicine, you know, there's a lot of people in a whole lot of different um, fields of study and field of uh, in different careers here. And I think that that type of information is not well known. So I, I made it my business to, to, to raise awareness about it. So that's, that was the, the impetus for my taking on the column. And I, it kind of, uh, well, I, it became the the, the 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 source of the authority on blackness in Asia. You know, I, I didn't anticipate that, but uh, it just it blew up, you know. And um, 
and it was it's being it was being read like in in every country in Asia. I was getting emails and letters from all over the place. So I was like blown away. But anyway, um, uh, this is uh, this led to the first activism that I officially took on here in Japan. Um, when I first arrived here in Japan, I, re I remember I was hanging out with some Japanese friends and we went down to, uh, to Shibuya and we were going to a bar and I looked up on the, uh, on the wall and there was a, a poster advertising a group called the uh, Gosparats and uh, they were in blackface and I was, I was really shocked, you know, and um, the, 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 the guys I were with, I was with, they were, they saw me looking at it, staring at it, and they were like, oh, Kakui, right? This is so cool, right? I'm like, uh, not so much, you know, but um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to ruin the good moves. I kind of kept my feelings to myself and whatnot, but um, I looked into it later, and it turns out that, you know, gospel rats, it's not, it's not a racialized thing at all for them. They just feel like this is their way of, of paying homage to uh, black musicians that they love from this period. So this whole menstrual outfit is, is their way of, of, of showing their respect, they, they said, to for um, black musicians in, from that Motown and pre-Motown era. So I said, you know, this is something I'm just gonna have to accept. This is, you know, this is not America, this is Japan. They don't have the same history, same background, same relationship with this, uh, this, with blackface that we do. So I need to accept it from their perspective. But then in 2015, um, the same group, well, they changed their name from Gospel Rats to Rats and Star. So now um, the same guys who, who said they black up to show their respect and adoration for black people and black music. Now they were performing with a J-pop idol group called uh, Momo Ido Clover Zetto. And these girls, they have no connection to black music, black culture. And I was wondering, well, what's the, why you put them in blackface, you know? So now I realized that for them, this is their gimmick. It's not about showing respect, it's about this is how they are recognized. This is what distinguishes them from other groups here in Japan. And um, this is their, you know, so this is their signature, their gimmick, and they're passing this baton of ignorance on to the next generation. I just thought that was unacceptable. However, I still didn't feel like, and at that time I had been here for almost 10 years, but I still didn't feel like, well, I felt a bit more, uh, uh, emboldened to to take action, but I still felt like, you know, this is their thing, this is their culture, who am I to come into their country and tell them to do this thing? So I put together uh, a petition on change.org and I made the petition in Japanese because I wanted to target Japanese people. I, I pretty much knew that, you know, foreigners were, were gonna feel one way about it, not necessarily going to be against it, but they're going to find, they, so many are going to think that it's problematic, but I, I was curious what Japanese felt about it. So I put the petition together in Japanese and I put it on uh, change.org and, and it, I explained that um, though this may not be, you know, this, it, it may not be intentionally racist, it's going to be perceived that way. So I think that, um, Rats and Star and Momo Ido Club was that they need to be aware that the rest of the world is not going to be as lenient as you know the black people who've been here in Japan and know that you know this is not especially not an especially racist country, but you know they're not going to give that that benefit of the doubt. So I put the petition together and I sent it to um, Fuji TV, who was uh, the, it was going to air on a program called. Um, that's the name of the program. It was a Saturday evening program, Music Fair, I think. And um, I sent it to I sent it to Fuji TV. I sent it to their sponsor. I sent it to um, different um, Japanese uh, groups here in Japan. And um, I sent they also sent the open letters to um, Michelle Obama, who was en route to Japan at the time, and also to. Um, um, Jack, uh, Caroline Kennedy, who was the 
the uh, U.S. ambassador at the time. And lo and behold, um, they canceled the programming. I, I didn't want to make it out that Japan is the only country that, that does this blackface. As you can see, you know, blackface is a uh, it's something that's that's enjoyed by um, Asians and Europeans all over the world. So it's uh, I didn't want to point the finger at Japan, but at the same time, they need to be aware that how this is going to be perceived by people of, of African descent. So as you can see here, Music Fair edited the program. It was a successful petition. Over 5,000 or nearly 5,000 people signed the petition. 5,000 Japanese people signed the petition. And um, Fuji TV canceled the, 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 the blackface segment of this program. However, there was no media coverage of this incident. A major corporation, um, a major media outlet alters this programming in response to a, a petition from Japanese viewers and not a single media outlet covered that's including Asai, except for Japan Times because I wrote about it. But aside from um, Japan Times and maybe I think the USA Today did a story on it as well. But other than that, no Japanese media coverage. So Japanese people were unaware of how problematic um, blackface was. So of course it occurred again. This was in 2018. Um, Hamada San is a very popular comedian here. He decided to impersonate Eddie Murphy by, um, by blackening up. Now, I don't necessarily think it's racist, but it is problematic. And it's, um, he's, he, there are ways to, to impersonate a person without using black makeup. And he, I, that wasn't even an option, I'm sure. They just, this is something that was a, a regular occurrence at that time when, on Japanese television, blackface was a regular thing. And whenever I did encounter it, I would tweet about it or um, at least, you know, say something about it that, it, you know, this needs to be, needs to stop. And I did the same thing on this particular, this is the New Year's program of 2018. However, this time it got picked up by media all over the world. So these are the tweets I sent out on at that time. This is on New Year's Eve on, uh, on 2018. And um, I sent it out in Japanese and in English. And it went viral, the tweets. And as a result, you know, BBC and New York Times and a lot of the Western media picked up on it. And um, it, it became a, a huge, huge scandal. And, um, and this time, Japanese media did pick up on it. So as you can see here, Asahi and a different, even um, there, there was just, you know, uh, a great deal of coverage on it. Now, the problem for me was at the time I was, work, I was working as an ALT. And at the time, I, even though I had a popular blog and a column, most of it, most of what I was doing was in English. So none of the students and none of the uh, um, Japanese teachers were aware of my work outside of the school. But as a result of this Hamada incident, suddenly um, I no longer was um, able to, to have these separate lives. So uh, the Kirk McNeil and the Baye McNeil lives collided. My two worlds collided at this time. You know, because here I am in in in, uh, in in manga and everything. I mean, it was it was I had penetrated the Japanese media suddenly. So, and at the same time, I was doing a I did a TED talk in Kyoto that um, that uh, many people um, it, it got a lot of a good responses. So, um, at the time, a lot of the media here weren't aware of how problematic blackface was and they wanted someone to come and talk to them about it. You know, please ex explain to us why blackface is a problem. So this was a um, presentation that I did at TBS and the one I did at NHK explained to them why, you know, um, blackface is problematic, not necessarily racist, but problematic is going to be perceived as racist. And, um, also, they weren't aware of the history of blackface, which um, a lot of people presume presume that um, 
blackface in Japan doesn't have the same history as blackface in America, when actually it's very parallel. I mean, blackface has been in Japan since the 1800s when Commodore Perry brought it with him to Japan and Japanese have been doing it on their own since then. So they've been doing it um, parallel with the US since 1860s, 1850s. So um, it has a very, very long history. And they, the, when, they, when they first encountered it from um, Commodore Perry and his crew performing in it, they knew at the time it was disparaging um, people of African descent, it was clear. So they, when, when it was first introduced to Japan, it was clear that it was disparaging African, Af people of African descent and Japanese continued to do it. So it, it has a problematic um, origin here in Japan. Um, so I talked to them about that, about the back, about the history of blackface. Many of them did not even know that history. So um, that, um, really helped them make some decisions about whether they should continue that practice or not. And um, one second. And 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 actually, since that time, since that time, I have not seen blackface in Japanese media, in major media. Of course, um, you can't control YouTube and a bunch of knuckleheads on Halloween. You know. Um, Going, um, going around Shibuya, you know, in blackface. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about major media outlets have not done blackface since this Hamada incident. So um, that's significant. That is really significant. So I really, I'm really, uh, really proud of that. So um, in conclusion, in conclusion, I just want to talk a little bit about um, Um, of black, black Lives Matters. So a lot of people ask me, they say, why is Black, black Lives Matters, um, Black Lives Matter necessary in Japan? I mean, Japan is a homogenous country. Um, and I always tell them that um, it's that kind of thinking that contributes to the problem that um, Japan is not homogenous, that that's a myth and that, um, Case in point, um, you can look at uh, what occurred here. Well, one moment before I go there. Um, black, um, one moment. So there, there's some overlap between, um, between what, what, between, um, my life as an ALT here and my life as a, a writer activist here. And because of, of the work I've been doing as an activist here, I've been able to have opportunities to teach at various universities here, for example, at, at um, KO or Akea University or Waseda University. Here's some pictures from Waseda University. Here's some um, pictures from uh, some workshops that I've done. So it's given me opportunities to take my um, teaching outside of the, the classroom, the ALT world into, into the, um, the greater world of Japan and, and share some of the ideas that I've been talking about in the media and in my writing with directly with students and with people in the communities here in Japan. So um, that's kind of the, the overlap here. Uh, also, um, in the classrooms, I've had, because of um, teachers being aware of some of the work I've been doing with Black Lives Matters and with um, anti-Blackface anti and et cetera, they've been curious about how, what kind of things could I talk to the students about? So here, for example, um, there's a, there's a presumption in, in Japan that, um, you know, they associate certain holidays with, with foreigners, like Christmas is a foreign holiday, et cetera. Um, et cetera. So they would come to me, a lot of the teachers, and say, well, can you do um, a lesson about Christmas or about, you know, Halloween, et cetera? And these are holidays I don't really celebrate. But 
um, because of because of the work I've been doing outside of the schools, they the teachers would ask me, "Was well, there anything that you would like to talk about? You know, in, in connection with uh, you know black culture or, or African American culture?" And I said, "Well, yeah, you know." And here's an example of that: I do a, a lesson on an annual basis about Kwanzaa, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Kwanzaa, but it's a it's an African American holiday. It's not an African holiday. It's an African American holiday that started in 1966 by the same people who were responsible for the school I went to, the East, actually. So, um, I, and it's uh, it's based on a lot of the some some of the the harvest um, celebrations that take place in Africa. So. Yeah, I get to talk to the quiz of kids about Kwanzaa. It's celebrated by you know a few million people around the world, mostly in in America, Canada, and England. So um, yeah, I get to share my info, share my knowledge about Kwanzaa with the students. So these are some some of the other things I'm really proud about. You know that I get to to address some of the the the, the presumptions and and ignorances of the kids as far as as it, as it pertains to what. Um, what what non-Japanese you know engage in. Um, and I I you know I, I kind of explain to the students and this is my position on, on teaching English is that English is not the end all be all. It's just it's a tool, you know. And I, I tell them that, you know, if you're lucky, you may one day use English to improve the quality of life or to, to achieve some of the goals that you set for yourself. But, but in the end, it's just a tool. So your life will ultimately, ultimately be, be the result of what you've done with the, all the tools at your disposal, not just English. So um, this is the way I, I like to present English to the students. Um, because especially as an ALT, most of the students, the vast majority of students, they're not going to be using English after even junior high school, but high school, definitely. They're not going to be using English. But these other ideas that I have an opportunity to share with them will be useful in whatever they undertake in their post, um, in, in, their, in their lives. So I, I try to make sure that I get them not just English, but this as well. Um, and, and back to what I was talking about, about BLM, the reason, the reason I explained to people that BLM is necessary in Japan is because if BLM, if Black Lives truly mattered in Japan, incidents like what took place last year at, at NHK would not have occurred, I, I believe. Um, this particular video, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but this was a, a, a program that, that aired last year and it was supposed to be explaining, explaining to, to Japanese youth about um, the cause for, for um, a lot of the protests and rioting that was taking place in America last year. And one of the explanations it gave was that um, Black people were unhappy because of the economic discrepancies between blacks and whites and that, you know, due to COVID, um, a lot of people were losing their jobs. And the show didn't mention that, it didn't mention that black people were being murdered by police officers. So they kind of missed the major point of the unrest. And um, this type of thing doesn't happen if Black Lives Matters in Japan, because they would have spoken with a Black person before putting this on the air, first of all. They wouldn't have spoken exclusively to white police officers in Los Angeles before airing this. Um, they would not have been scolded by the, the US ambassador, you know, calling them out for being disrespectful and offensive. They would not have, you know, th a lot of things could have been avoided if um, Black Lives Matter here. So I think, but I think that um, this incident resulted in some really positive things. For example, um, NHK kind of altered some of its programming to 
to address this uh, this misinformation that that had been sent out, and um, and they brought in people of African descent and biracial people to talk about some of the challenges that people of African descent face here, and people of uh, and, and biracial people face here in Japan. And this is unprecedented stuff. And um, I was really proud to be a part of it. So um, the, the two things that, that have brought me the most pride <clears throat> will be that blackface has ended and that um, um, blackness in Japan or biracial um, challenges here in Japan are being addressed. Um, and it, it brings me back to what my mother was saying. She was very, uh, you know, she she saw the future. She she realized that um, that I could make a difference. I could be part of the the solution, regardless of where I'm at. And um, so, I just wanted to say thank you to her and thank you to all of you for um, your attention. And um, if you have any questions, uh, please um, put them in the comment area. I'd be happy to address them. So thank you very much. I thank you so much for your very deeply moving and personal talk today. Um, everyone at home, could we please give him a an at-home round of applause? And let's continue the thank yous. Um, thank you again to our audience for joining us today and also for all of your questions, which are coming in through our Q&A mechanism. Um, any questions that we're unable to answer right now, th those will be forwarded to the speaker and hopefully we'll get some answers back. Um, thank you also to our wonderful conference team, some of whom are up on the stage right now with me um, for making this program and these speakers happen today.